the visual impairment, if we don't deal with the emotions that are surrounding the visual impairment, uh, we're going to have a very difficult time uh, achieving success for them. In fact, I, I find that the single biggest predictor of how successful patients are going to be um, with products tends to be um, how well they're, they've dealt with the emotions uh, surrounding their visual impairment. Today's talk, I'll be speaking primarily, I assume, to three different groups of people. We have patients who are actually visually impaired. I'd imagine that some people listening right now are also family members of patients who are visually impaired. And also, hopefully, there are some professionals uh, who deal with um, helping patients during the rehabilitation process. And so during the talk, I will be speaking to all three groups. I find it customary to start off these talks kind of explaining why it is that I'm the one that's doing the talk. Um, my qualifications, basically, uh, professionally, I'm an optometrist. The practice I am in at Viewfinder in Arizona is limited to low vision optometry, meaning we only see patients who are visually impaired. I've had, um, throughout this talk, I've included a lot of direct quotes from actual patients. I find that in the years doing this, in the thousands of low vision patients I've, I've worked with, there are certain statements that come up all the time. And I think understanding that people are feeling the same way about these things can, can often help people deal with the emotions. On a personal level, um, there's visual impairment in my family. Uh, most notably, my grandfather has macular degeneration. And having uh, been very close to him and seeing the emotions and um, how he's dealt with his visual impairment, uh, have helped shape my opinion of how important uh, the coping with visual impairment is. Statistically speaking, um, vision loss is, has been shown over and over again in, in many different studies to be one of the more feared uh, disabilities um, that a patient could uh, come up against. In, in 1998, Gallup poll showed that 42% of adults listed blindness as the most feared disability. Uh, other studies have actually gone as far as showing that people tend to be more afraid of, of blindness and visual impairment than they are of death. Uh, the reason for this is obviously vision uh, is our most dominant sense. We use vision um, in most activities that we do during the day. And one of the hard things is people often equate their loss of vision with a loss of independence. What we found is that a person going through vision loss often goes through the exact same process of emotions a person with a terminal illness goes through. There's been some pretty famous work done on the stages of grief that, that patients go through when they are told that they have a terminal illness. And the, there's a few different iteration, iterations of uh, how these stages of grief break down. The, the way I have them broken down in this talk would be shock, denial, anger, depression, bargaining, and acceptance. Now, they don't always go in that exact order, but that tends to be the order that we see uh, patients go through. Acceptance um, is where we're going to start, even though it tends to be the last stage. Acceptance is important to understand because that is where we're hoping to help um, our patients and our family uh, get to. Uh, again, acceptance is usually the last stage. And the way I would define it is it's making peace with the permanence of vision loss and then moving forward with all possible treatment options considered. Nobody is ever going to be happy about the fact that they have lost vision. But the key is, is getting to a point where we've accepted what's happened and move on. Now, some people take weeks to get here. Some people take years. Uh, I have two examples that I tend to use when I'm talking on this topic. The first one is a patient that I saw that had an anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Uh, this was a gentleman who, three weeks before I met him, could see just as well as pretty much anybody else walking around and essentially went completely blind um, over a two-day period. 
and I saw him for the first time two weeks after he had lost all his eyesight. And he was already in that two weeks at a stage of acceptance for what happened. Um, that's an extreme. I just don't see people get to that stage that fast. And, and why he was able to, I've never been able to get exactly why that is. Otherwise, uh, we would have everybody do that. But um, it was pretty impressive that he was able to get there. The other extreme um, I use is my grandfather. Uh, he has had macular degeneration and been visually impaired from macular degeneration since the late 90s. And I would say, judging from interacting with him uh, pretty regularly, he is still not at a stage of acceptance. And so those are two extremes. It is our job to try to help patients get to the stage of acceptance as quickly as possible. Now, in my family, it's been very difficult with my grandfather. Um, professionally, I, I'm much more successful. And I think that's just uh, because he's he remembers when I was a little kid, and, and it's hard to listen to that from your grandson. But um, I do think that there are strategies that, that we use that can be pretty successful. And so as we're going through the different stages, after we introduce what the stages are, I will be giving strategies that both professionals and family members can be using to help uh, their loved ones and their, their clients uh, to uh, get to the stage of acceptance. If you happen to be the person who is visually impaired, I feel like this is helpful to understand the stages because when you recognize them, they'll hopefully help you get to the point of acceptance. The first stage typically is shock. And shock is when it, it basically seems as if the brain just stops gathering new information and it's just stuck in time. Uh, when people are going through shock, they'll often say that it took them a few days to process what the doctors have told them. Um, a direct quote from a patient would be, I didn't even know what was going on. All of a sudden, he was putting a needle in my eye. This is a patient with macular degeneration who was getting injections um, for some bleeding that was occurring. And in their mind, they were so numb to what was happening um, that they uh, just all of a sudden kind of woke up out of it and there was a needle going in their eye. And, and I hear this all the time. Um, in fact, last week I had a patient and I told them I was glad they came in because I was doing this talk this week. Um, she was telling me word for word exactly what I just said, where she said, you know, they were telling me all this stuff and, and for a few days I didn't even know, remember them talking to me about it. And, and finally I kind of snapped out of it. And shock is our body's way of dealing with emotionally painful situations and physically painful situations. Thankfully, it, it does tend to be the, the shortest stage people go through. Um, now, from a family standpoint or from a, a rehabilitation provider standpoint, it is one of the harder stages for us to actually help patients get through quickly. Uh, my advice to people tends to be, you just need to be there for the patient. Uh, giving the patient facts um, when they're in this stage is just not going to help them because they're just not going to be able to process them. And that tends to be our, our instinct is to immediately start telling the patient uh, everything they read, everything you went and read on the internet um, about this condition. And, and the truth is, is uh, I, I tell people it, it probably sounds kind of like Charlie Brown's teacher to them where it's wah, 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 because they're just not able to process it yet. Now, again, hopefully people move through this stage pretty quickly. The next stage that people tend to go through would be denial. Um, and this is when patients doubt the diagnosis that they've been given. Um, this is a stage that I see people get stuck in um, for quite a while. Uh, some quotes that I've seen people say uh, many, many, many times would be, are you sure? It's not just my glasses prescription. Um, I need another opinion. Uh, I have almost every patient I come in just assumes that we should just be able to give them better glasses. And part of that is because they tend to be in this denial stage still. Um, I've had patients say things like, I just didn't get enough sleep last night. If you test me tomorrow, I'll see better and you won't think I have a macular degeneration. Even though um, sleep has nothing to do with how your eye physically looks under examination, um, that is something that I actually hear 
um, many times. I had a patient once told me, they told me I have dry macular, not wet, so I can't be bleeding. Are you sure you aren't just seeing things? Again, um, this is just a, a mechanism that they've, they've come up with where they've just decided, well, I can only have dry macular, I can't move to wet. Well, we know physiologically that's not true. Everybody starts with dry and, and about 15 to 20 percent of people turn wet. Um, but uh, patients often, like I said, latch on to one diagnosis and assume nothing else can happen. Um, another one I heard was, those doctors have never told me I have macular degeneration. And, and I responded, well, why did you think that they were giving you shots in your eyes? And the patient just said, to help my eyes. And so this was a patient who was actually receiving injections in their eyes and they just uh, never put it together that they were getting those because of macular degeneration. Part of that might have been they were still a little bit of shock and not processing what happened. Um, but again, they're also denying the fact that um, they do have a serious uh, condition like macular degeneration. To help patients get to acceptance um, during the denial stage, this is where helping them understand that you do have some expertise in this area uh, can, can be a big, a big help. Uh, as family, um, the more that they trust that you understand what they're going to go through, uh, the easier it will be to, to help. And I have strategies to help me because I, I need patients to trust me about this. And, and just, again, spouting off facts is, is important. Um, when I explain medical conditions, scotomas, which are blind spots, acknowledging that, you know, flaws in typical refractions, that's when I'm doing an exam on patients. They've, they've typically had many refractions done where we're testing for glasses prescription, and, and they just feel like it's not going right. And, and if I'm willing to sit there and say, look, the way they've done it probably doesn't work, but when I do a trial frame refraction and I can give patients bigger choices in lenses, it makes it um, so that we can fine-tune that prescription. Explaining medical things like that can help them understand that I, I do know what they're going through. Um, for, pay, for a family of patients, I think uh, understanding that they are going to have good days and they're going to have bad days is going to go a long way towards helping the, the visual impaired patient um, trust that you do understand what they're going through. I would say that the fluctuation in vision is one of the hardest things for family members of visually impaired patients to understand. Um, I have had my brothers, my, my parents, um, even my sister who is an eye doctor at some point say to me, Grandpa's not really as blind as he pretends, is he? And they say that because there are times where he sees things that they just don't understand how he could see that. But then there's other times where he can't even see something right in front of them. And, and it's hard for people who don't have visual impairment to understand that. The more you can learn about the condition and understand why it is that grandpa can see that speck of chocolate on the floor that you spilled, but he can't see your face when you walk through the door, the more you understand or you can show that you understand that, the better that the patient is going to be at, at trusting that you, you understand what they're going through. Um, once they do trust you, um, you can help them come to terms with their diagnosis and they'll be able to move on past denial. Um, now after denial, we tend to see uh, anger. And anger usually begins with the question, why me? And, and the problem is, is there's really no good answer to that in a lot of patients. Now there are some patients who are visually impaired because a surgeon um, had a, a, a mistake. Uh, but that's rare. More often, uh, there isn't a real answer to where we can say, you got this because of that. And, and because there isn't something we can point to as to why um, they're having these problems, that anger tends to get put onto people who are around them. Um, and patients sometimes are resentful of others uh, who have just not had to experience the loss that they are. During this stage, you'll see patients often make very emotionally charged comments, and I'm going to share some of those that I've heard. Uh, one thing that it's amazing how often this comes up in, in this direct quote, and again, it just goes to show you that patients uh, tend to go through the same stage 
uh, something I hear all the time is, if you tell me I can't drive, you might as well chop my legs off. And, and the fact that so many patients equate not being able to drive with um, not being able to walk and having their legs chopped off uh, just shows you the, com the common uh, way that people experience these emotions. Um, I've also had patients say, reading is my life. If I can't read, I should just die. Um, patients often display their anger in irrational and uncharacteristically mean comments. Um, I had a patient once tell me, if I had been a younger man when I met that cataract surgeon that did me in, I'd be in jail for assault right now. Now, I'll be honest with you, I had spent 45 minutes with the, the patient at that point and had found them to be a very, very kind, pleasant person, and that statement just did not mix with the impression I had of this gentleman. And all it was was this anger that he, he was holding um, from losing visual or losing vision uh, coming out. I always make sure patients understand that it is perfectly normal to feel anger about vision loss. Uh, we should never have the expectation that someone should not feel upset that they're having to deal with something like losing vision. Uh, it is normal to feel anger about that. The key is, is we need to help identify when someone is holding on to that anger uh, and help them deal with it. If the anger is out of control or hurting relationships, it may be necessary to, to see a counselor or a therapist or, or a professional who can help them uh, deal with their, their anger issues. Uh, patients, again, should understand that it is normal to feel angry. However, you have to get through it and you have to deal with it in a healthy way. Uh, as family of patients who are visually impaired, it's important to kind of have it on your radar to identify areas of misplaced anger and, and, and help patients realize that the true cause of their anger is not what they're talking about, but actually their, their vision loss. After anger, we tend to, to see a lot of depression. Um, and depression is something that's very, very common in, in my patients. Um, again, it's a normal reaction to vision loss. Um, the problem for depression is, is that people tend to have their self-image or their self-worth decrease uh, because of vision loss because they're just not able to do the things that they're able to do before. Um, I've had patients say things like, I'm pretty much worthless now. He or she does everything for me. Um, I can't even sign a check anymore. You know, and again, these, these statements that you're hearing that, that there is a lot of emotion within them. Um, but our, our big warning signs that someone is depressed because their self-worth just feels worse. I hear this every day. I feel like I'm in first grade when I try to read. Patients with conditions like macular degeneration are no longer able to scan their eyes when they're reading and, and see the next word before they actually get to it. So they have to read word by word, letter by letter. Well, understanding that that is just physically how they have to do it sometimes will help them deal with the depression they're feeling for the fact that they can't read the way they once did. Um, another thing I hear all the time is I always had perfect eyes. I don't understand how this happened to me. And, and it does seem to hit people who are known for having the, the great vision throughout their life that suddenly don't see well. It's almost like they've lost their badge of honor there. Um, I wrote pilots under there because that's the group of, of um, people who we always think of as having great vision and, and they've been known for that and now when that's taken away it's, it's very difficult for them. It's important to understand some of the signs of depression. Um, some of the statements that we that I mentioned are, are things that you'll hear but you'll also see signs of depression in, in, in um, patients by seeing that they're having changes in their sleeping patterns. Now when I say that now that can go both ways. You can have a patient who suddenly is sleeping dramatically more than they used to, or you can have patients who suddenly don't sleep and are having trouble sleeping. But um, if there is a, a pretty large shift in, in how much you're sleeping, either more or less, that can be a sign of depression. Um, changing in eating habits, again, some patients deal with their depression by eating a lot. Other patients um, stop eating. Uh, changes in activity level, again, that typically um, shows itself in decreasing activity level. Um, and so those are things that 
as professionals working with people with visual impairment or family members, you want to be aware of. Um, and again, if you're someone who has visual impairment, you want to watch for those things yourself um, so you can identify them and, and, and get the help you need. Um, when we do identify those, again, we need to try to help patients um, continue to lead as independent a lifestyle as possible and, and again, get patients the assistance that they need. Um, the next step um, that we tend to go through would be bargaining. Uh, the way I describe this is patients often try to negotiate a treatment. Um, and again, this is one of the more common things uh, that I hear every day. Uh, how about you just give me stronger glasses? And, and you know, that's a, a statement that I've, I've worked on my response to through the years. Um, I tend to tell patients things like, well, I can always go stronger. Uh, and to try to lighten the mood a little bit, I'll say things like, you know, I don't get paid by the power. You know, I can give, write whatever number I want on that prescription. It doesn't affect me at all. And so the key is, is do the stronger glasses actually help you? And, and there is compromise to stronger prescription, and, and, and we talk about the compromises that are involved. I've had patients say things uh, like, you know, I saw this guy who had these special glasses that he could read with, and he was blind. Why don't you just give me those? And, and that's a statement that I hear. It comes in a little different phrasing every once in a while, but it generally is someone along the line has, has come and shown something, and, and the patient didn't really get much experience with it, but it just sounds really good. Um, the, the truth is, is and, and I tell patients this, there, there really are no magic glasses that are just going to make people see. Uh, now, obviously, as technology improves, we are getting better and better options. We're getting closer to that, that, uh, that uh, realization. But um, at this point, there are no magic glasses. Everything I prescribe to help patients who have visual impairment see better uh, comes with a certain level of compromise. If we're doing stronger glasses, you're going to have to hold the material you're reading closer. If we're doing telescopic magnification, you're losing field of view. And in fact, most magnification decreases field of view. We'll talk about some magnification options that don't decrease the field of view and, and minimize that compromise, but there always is compromise. And I tell patients, you know, if there were magic glasses or there were something like you're describing, I promise you that my grandfather would have them, okay? And, and I just don't have that for him. And sometimes by understanding that, you know, this is personal to me, that helps patients recognize that we do understand what they're going through. Um, it's important that we do recognize when patients are just bargaining with us. And I, and I would say this is one of the more important skills that I had to learn in working with patients with visual impairment. Um, because a lot of times they'll be bargaining with us instead of truly accepting the treatment option that I'm providing for. And when that happens, they just end up with a bunch of devices that end up in a drawer and don't get used. An example would be, oh yeah, sure, I fully understand that I'll have to hold things closer with these new glasses. And, and patients will tell me, I, I, I go over this with them, you know, three or four times in a pip span of about 30 minutes, we just have this discussion over and over that they're going to have to hold things closer. Then sure enough, when they get the, the, the glasses, they return them after a few days and they say, well, I knew I was going to have to hold things close, but not that close. And in their mind, I think they were, they just worked it out that if I just get the glasses, then maybe I won't have to hold them as close as what he's saying. But then when it turns out that they do, um, it no longer is going to be a, a useful option for them. And so I have to try my best to make sure that I know when patients um, are bargaining with me instead of actually accepting the, the treatment option I provide them to make it so that they're more successful with it. Uh, one area that patients really tend to do a lot of bargaining in, and I'm going to use it as an example, um, because I think it, it also can be used in other situations uh, besides this, is driving. And so let's go through some statements that I hear a lot about driving. Um, I think driving is an important thing for us to be willing to talk about. Um, as families, you have to be willing to discuss difficult topics like this. I, I tell patients, 
part of my job is telling people they can drive, and part of my job is telling people they can't. Obviously, I, I much prefer when I get to tell people that they are able to drive. Um, but every patient that I fill out a driver's form allowing them to drive, I, I tend to finish with the statement, uh, now I promise you when you're not passing, I will tell you that you're not allowed to drive. And, and patients respect that. And, uh, but the, the hard part is, is uh, patients are able to bargain uh, their way into thinking that they still can drive. Here are some statements I hear a lot. I only drive in my comfort zone. And while that is a good strategy, because when you're driving in areas you know, you don't have to read street signs, which gives you more opportunity to look for pedestrians and other cars, the truth is, is there's a higher percentage of accidents that happen close to home as opposed to further away. Another statement I hear is, I scan my eyes all the time when I'm driving. And, and that's usually said by patients with peripheral vision problems, and they say, well, I always look all around. and they, this. The response to that is, well, what happens when you're looking to the right when something comes from the left? Again, these are things that um, we have to be careful in talking to patients because I don't want to um, shut them off to being able to help uh, with other items, but it is important that we are willing to talk about these things. Another one I hear is, I've driven for X number of years without any accidents or tickets. And usually it's a pretty substantial number of years, 60 years or 50 years. And, and the response to that is, again, well, how many of those years were you visually impaired when you drove? And, and I tell patients, you know, I really appreciate the fact that you have a good driving record. That, that's better than if you were telling me you were a terrible driver before you were visually impaired. But the fact is, is those years don't really count when um, they were driven with, with perfect eyesight. Um, another thing I hear is, I just need to drive this many blocks to go visit my spouse in the nursing home. Again, um, it, it, there's not a lot of pleasure in telling someone that they aren't safe to be able to drive to see their spouse in their nursing home, but at the same time, uh, we have to protect the patient and other people on the road from talking themselves into making a, a poor choice in, in when they're driving when they shouldn't be. Um, again, high percentage of accidents actually occur near the home and, and where people are. This is what I hear all the time. I just need the license in case of an emergency. And I ask the patient, well, what emergency are you talking about? And, and usually it's, well, something's happened to my spouse and I have to drive them to the hospital. And I tell them, you know, you don't want your first time driving in several years to be when you're driving your spouse to the hospital. You're just not going to be in an emotionally stable um, frame of mind and to be able to, to make good choices when you're driving. That's what ambulances are for, and you should use them in that case. If you're not comfortable driving in normal situations, you really should not be driving in an emergency. Um, I'll know when it's time to stop driving. Believe me, I'm not one of those reckless people. And, and when I hear this from people, it usually is very good people with very, and, and they are trying to be honest with themselves. But, the, but what I ask them is, well, what, what measures will you use to know that you're not able to drive? Um, how are you going to know? And uh, one strategy I tell people is when you start noticing uh, things like, wow, where did that car come from? Or, oh, I didn't even know there was a person there. If that's starting to happen consistently, you have to stop driving. And so being willing to talk about these things is important. Um, I'll be honest with you, I tend to save this discussion until after um, I've provided the options for uh, keeping independence as far as all the low vision aids, because if I have this driving talk before we introduce all those ideas, um, it, they're not going to work. The patient is shut off usually, and so we do save this for the end um, strategically. Uh, um, this is probably pretty self-explanatory. Uh, my wife tells me when it is safe to turn, um, and, and if you knew how many times I've, I've heard this strategy, um, where the, the, the patient is driving and they just assume that it's okay that their wife tells them when to turn or when a car is there. Um, you might be a little scared to, to go on the road yourself because I hear this constantly and, and I just um, don't understand how uh, they, they would think that that's okay um, to have someone relaying a message of a car is coming and you're about to hit it in time. And so um, I always say, well, if your wife's the one paying seeing these things, why isn't she driving or he? It's the other way around. 
Um, I know I don't see well, but I only drive on isolated roads. If I crash, I won't hurt anyone else. Uh, that was the exact quote from a patient um, who had been seen for about five years, and I told him he couldn't drive because his peripher peripheral vision had decreased. Uh, we got a letter from, in the mail from his family uh, exactly a month later uh, that he had been killed in a long car accident, uh, just like he, he told me he was going to. Um, and, and through the years, seeing so many patients, it's helped me by accumulating stories like that. It, it's a terrible story, and I, and I hate having to tell it, but it, it does make it easier on me to say no when I have to say no. Um, again, that was a long, drawn-out discussion on driving, but that, that applies to other things that people are dealing with as far as independence, that we have to make hard decisions. Uh, sometimes when patients become visually impaired, they do have to move somewhere where they can find assistance uh, and they can have people prepare meals for them, you know, depending on the level of vision impairment. And again, those are not easy discussions to have, but they're discussions that we, we have to be willing to have. Uh, again, with bargaining, we just have to really recognize when the patients are bargaining and not accepting or adapting, and, and, and it can be challenging because they sound the same. Um, as family members, you just have to help patients have realistic expectations for their low vision aids. And so we've gone through these stages that people go through. Um, I think we it's important that we also give you some tools on, on how to help patients in these stages. Again, I've given little short little statements, but a general philosophy on how to respond to patients um, that uh, we use is, is the 3.0 response. And again, I'm shifting gears here, and, and, and this part of the webinar is to, to help people who are around visual impairment uh, learn how to talk with their loved ones about their vision loss. Um, if you, again, are listening and you happen to be the person who has uh, had vision loss, these tools can help you to, to think differently about um, how your loss is affecting you. Um, we need to be able to respond in a way that helps them cope with their vision loss. And again, uh, there are some, some pretty simple tools that do help us with that. The, the truth is, is that stressful life situations often accompany vision loss. And so... I'll have patients who their vision got worse right after passing of a spouse, or um, they had hip surgery and their vision got worse. And the, the problem is, is they'll often equate these events with their loss. And so I'll ask a patient, you know, do you do much reading anymore? No, I haven't read much since my spouse died. When someone says something like that to me, um, if I don't address the emotion that they've tied to that um, reading, uh, we're not going to be able to help them. So if we don't help the patient separate the, the emotions they're feeling from losing their spouse from reading, then we're just going to have a hard time being successful with reading. And so, again, patients will often use you know, emotional stressful situations in life. They also use bad medical outcomes to explain all future problems. I had a patient yesterday who during the exam I noticed about the fourth time she basically said they didn't get those glasses right last time did they? And the truth is is they didn't. The, the prescription was not correct um, and it was set up in a way where it was giving the patient double vision. Uh, the problem is, is is that patient had latched on to the fact that they had cause the problem by uh, giving her bad glasses. Now, if I can't get her emotionally separated from that, then um, I, I'm just not going to be able to help her. And so I had to spend about 15 minutes really explaining why what I'm doing is different, why it's going to work. Uh, again, um, I would show her a magnifier, she would read it, and then it would immediately go read with it, and then she'd go to, well, yeah, but those glasses didn't work for me last time. And the two don't have anything to do with each other, but she is equating that, that poor prescribing of glasses with her vision loss. And, and again, we have to separate those things for her. Um, something I heard a patient say, ever since that doctor botched my cataract surgery, I can't read the newspaper. Well, when you look at the patient's history that said this, uh, they had had the surgery on their worst eye, 
Um, and after that surgery that didn't go so well, the patient still read for, for many years. Um, later on, they developed macular degeneration in their better eye. And even though there was several years separated between the surgery that went bad in the poor eye and the macular that started in the better eye, they, they equated the two. And again, we have to help patients separate those things. Um, again, when a patient makes comments like this during the exam, I, I pretty much stop what I'm doing and we talk about it um, to help separate those feelings. Um, if it's not addressed, I can show the patients the greatest uh, tools and options in the world and, and they're just not going to work for them. Um, so this response that I tend to use, uh, we learned in school, and, and, and I think it's actually a, a pretty useful tool, is labeled as the 3.0 response. Um, and, and the simple, bare-bones way of doing it is um, using the statement, you feel blank because blank. And so uh, the first blank, you feel angry, you feel upset, you feel sad, um, you feel a lot of pain. Um, and then because, and, and then the, your, the cause of it. And so when you make this response, you're acknowledging the emotion and the cause of the emotion. Our tendency in communicating with, with people tends to be we just acknowledge the emotion. Um, I understand you feel angry. If I don't connect that with the cause of the anger, then the person I'm speaking to doesn't necessarily believe or um, trust that I know why they're angry. And so we have to connect the two. Um, an example would be, you feel angry because your vision was worse after cataract surgery than before. And so that would be a statement I would say to that patient I was mentioning a moment ago. Um, another one way of saying it would be, you must have felt a huge loss when the spouse you loved and shared all those memories with passed away. You see in the first example, um, I use the, the template, you feel because. Um, in the second one, um, I didn't say you feel because, but I did the same thing where I addressed the emotion. You must have felt a huge loss. Um, and then I addressed the cause of it. Um, the spouse had passed away. Uh, when we were learning in school, they taught us, start by using you feel because. And it sounds robotic, but the fact is, is people don't tend to pick up on it. Um, that you're saying a template uh, statement like that, and it actually does bring down barriers. Um, I, I joke with patients because, or with people who I'm teaching this to, because uh, early in my relationship with my wife, she caught on to this eventually. Um, she would hear me say, you feel because, and, and she'd say, you know, don't use those optometry mind tricks on me, you know, and so, um, but uh, the truth is, is communicating even with a spouse uh, can be benefited by, again, when, when you're seeing an emotion in someone, addressing the emotion and the cause of the emotion. And that's a very important tool. And once you've acknowledged those emotions and the cause of it, the patients are going to be more willing to separate them from the treatment options being presented. And again, that's, that's what we need. Um, as families of patients who are visually impaired, I would say that the biggest, most important thing you can do is, is help find the balance between helping your family member and hindering them. And, and, and again, this can be very difficult to do. Uh, I tend to see people fall into two categories. Um, one of them, and a, and a big trap would be um, allowing a patient to become totally dependent on their family members. Um, now, um, becoming dependent on others can be actually more disabling than, than the disease itself. And, and that's one extreme. Um, again, I use my grandfather as an example. He was someone who, who really, when his vision started failing him, um, chose not to fight um, his vision loss and, and chose to um, make my grandma do everything for him. And, and, and the danger in that is now my grandma's suffering from pretty severe dementia and is no longer able to take care of their household and, and he is not able to um, learn the techniques that he needed to learn because he didn't well. Uh, he still could while he still had some vision. And he is someone who, if he hadn't have become so dependent on her, 
uh, they would be able to be uh, in a better place right now. Um, families need to help support patients' independence by encouraging them to try new things. And, and that's kind of the ex other extreme. Um, patients will also sometimes be so stubborn and won't let anybody help them and they get stuck in a rut where they just aren't doing anything or trying anything new because they just won't let anybody help them. And, and as families, we need to help support patients um, trying to gain their independence by encouraging them to try to use new things. Um, help patients realize that they should be willing to purchase necessary tools. Um, I have a lot of patients who we, uh, we provide them with options that could help them stay more independent. And then when it comes down to it, they decide that they just don't want to spend their money on those things. And, and that's understandable. Um, there's a limited amount of income and, and um, resources for everybody. However, the price of independence um, is often minimized by patients. And, and families can help people through that and help them understand, well, you do need to spend this money so that you can be more independent. Um, ultimately, our, our goal, obviously, is to help patients uh, regain their independence. Um, I always tell people, with the correct tools, almost everyone with a visual impairment will be able to do more than they think they can do. And, and um, it can be a defeating thing, losing vision. And again, it, it puts people in a place where they tend to feel like they, they can't do things. Um, and if they're given the right tools, then they usually can. Um, the key to it, the key to successful low vision rehabilitation is to use the correct aids and use them correctly. And so when someone gets to a point of acceptance um, emotionally, uh, this is where we really need to make sure that we are getting uh, the correct low vision aids to help people uh, stay as independent as possible. Um, and again, just to follow up what I said before, the, the most significant barrier to improvement is often a resistance to, to learning something new. And so dealing with the emotions, um, like we've discussed, is critical. And, and if we don't deal with those emotions, then patients are not going to be successful uh, moving forward. Now, we can't just deal with the emotions either. We need to provide tools um, to help patients cope with their visual impairment by actually living independent lives. And that's what we're going to talk about um, at this point. Um, now, when it comes to aids to help people with visual impairment, there are many different options. Um, and in fact, that's probably a whole other talk uh, where we talk about all the different aids. Um, today, what I want to discuss is, is a new field um, in, I say new, it's, uh, historically we've been using these for decades, but we, there's been a lot of advancement in the last five to ten years. Um, but we're going to be talking about electronic magnification devices. Uh, because I do think that this is the future um, of my industry and, and uh, of helping patients with visual impairment uh, adapt. And so electronic devices, the reason why they are so important to understand and why they are so helpful, some major advantages to them. Well, one, they have a very large range of magnification, up to 75 times in some instances. The other thing electronic devices do better than, than optical magnifiers or glasses is they can actually enhance contrast. Uh, newspapers that are gray and black can be made into white and black, or they can reverse it to black and white. And so helping someone see uh, with better contrast is a very important tool. Um, they also do not produce glare as much as, as uh, lenses do, optical magnifiers. Um, you can usually use the more increased working distance. You don't have to be as close to the things that you're working with. Uh, many of the devices we talk about are compatible with your computers. Um, one of the advantages to them recently uh, is they have become very portable and, and devices that you can actually carry around. We have some that actually capture and save images. Um, and now we even have some that can help you see off in the distance. Um, some disadvantages that people will list about, about electronic devices is cost. Um, and, and the truth is, is when you compare the cost of a handheld magnifier to an electronic magnifier, initially uh, you will see that the electronic magnifier does cost more. However, um, some advantages to the electronic magnifiers is they do offer multiple magnification levels. And so it's a one-time investment as opposed to buying a new magnifier every time you're 
vision changes. Um, so from a long-term cost, it, it's really not that different. There's also many programs available in different states to help with the cost of these devices. Um, another thing you used to hear a lot about was, well, they're not very portable. Again, that's not true anymore. Um, and then hard to use, um, hard to learn how to use an electronic device. Uh, I've worked with a generation historically that's not as into technology. However, uh, they've made these devices so user-friendly that um, patients just really uh, take to them very easily. Um, there's four main types of electronic devices that are on the market at this point. Uh, the newest one would be the HD and text-to-speech CCTVs. Um, the difference that separates them from a desktop CCTV would be that uh, they are actually now scanning a reading material and then reading it back to you. So someone doesn't even have to read a single letter on the page. Uh, the, the machine is actually reading it back to you. So you don't have to be able to see to use that. Um, a desktop CCTV uh, is historically what we think of when we think of electronic magnifiers. Um, there's also portable handheld CCTVs now. And then there's the new type that I kind of call the Acrobat class. Um, one of our newest ones that we have in our office is called the DaVinci, um, H-D-O-C-R. And the DaVinci is one of these new um, devices that actually can read to you. Um, it's a high-performance desktop video magnifier. Uh, it has a three-in-one camera, and what that means is you can use it to see material at near. You can also point the camera far away so you can see in the distance. And you can also point it at yourself, and it does a reverse uh, of the image so that it's like looking in a mirror. So patients who want to do makeup or, or see if they've shaved clean uh, can use it to see their face. Uh, obviously, one thing that's really helped in our industry is HD technology, um, and that's helped provide uh, a much more crystal clear picture and, and real vibrant colors and contrast. Um, and so that, that's made our devices much more useful than they used to be as well. Um, and you know, we have listed experience, the joy of reading with the push of a button. Again, you, you push a button that says capture on it, and it scans the page that you have underneath the camera, and it reads back to you. Um, it uses a, a camera that's an autofocus camera, um, which is very helpful. The old style CCTVs, you actually had to focus them. You know, I said um, getting someone whose vision is not in focus and having them try to focus things was never a, a very easy task. So the fact that the cameras are autofocus right now um, is a very helpful thing. Um, the, the monitor on the DaVinci is a 24 inch high resolution HD LCD monitor. Uh, as, high of quality as you can. One, one benefit that I've seen in, in our practice with that is patients who don't require uh, a lot of magnification, who can read at a little bit lower level of magnification, historically have had some trouble uh, when they put their CCTVs on those lower magnification with some of the image quality. Well, with the DaVinci, um, it's such a good screen and a good camera that even at the lowest magnification level, it's still pretty crystal clear. And, and that's been a big benefit because if you can get it to where you're using less magnification, you're seeing more field of view. Um, another of these OCR or um, speaking CCTVs is the new Merlin HD OCR. Uh, this device is very much like the original Merlin um, except for it does have uh, HD monitor and the text-to-speech um, capability. Um, and so because of that, it, it operates similar to the DaVinci um, in, in that it can read to you. Um, and again, there's a 24-inch high-resolution uh, screen, um, and you can uh, just push the capture button, and it'll read what's underneath uh, on your tray. Uh, there's literally 28 different viewing modes that you can use uh, with different contrasts, different colors, um, to make it so that it, it works as well as a popular could for you individually. Uh, the Merlin screen can also pivot horizontally and vertically, and, and that's helpful. I've seen patients use this in their kitchen, and they want to be able to see the recipe while they're working over at the uh, other side of the kitchen in the oven, and so they'll turn their screen and position it so they can see it. So that's a, a good flexible option. Uh, the Merlin LCD and HD uh, is very similar to the 
uh, one I just presented, the difference is it doesn't have the, the speech capability. Um, the advantage to these desktop CCTVs is they do combine a very large magnification range with a large field of view. And I would say that's one of the major things that separates video magnifiers or electronic magnifiers from an optical magnifier is just the ability to see a very large field of view um, with a large amount of magnification. With magnifiers, the stronger we get, the smaller the lens is, the smaller the field of view. Whereas with these electronic magnifiers, you can see a whole column a lot of times, or a whole page even. The Merlin has a very smooth tray that allows uh, reading to be a little smoother because the, the material is moving um, and it's not jumping as much. And it has very easy controls uh, to use. Um, it's an excellent, excellent option for reading and writing. Another thing that people tend to use these uh, desktop CCTVs for a lot is looking at photos. I know my grandfather uses his CCTV to look at pictures. Um, and that's been a, a big part in helping him. Um, because when my daughter was born, he looked at her and he said, well, she sounds cute. Um, and that was his way of, of joking about the fact that he couldn't see her. Um, well, we put her picture up on his CCTV and zoom it up real big, and, and he is able to see her face. And, and it helps him enjoy her a, a whole lot more. Um, again, the Merlin HD and the Merlin LCD um, both have simple, easy-to-use controls. There's, there's different size monitors available. Um, the bigger the monitor, the bigger the field of view. And so uh, we always try to, to help people understand that the bigger monitor is a better option. Uh, the reason someone would choose a smaller monitor tends to just be it does cost less for smaller monitors. Um, but I find that the, the increased field of view is worth the increased uh, price because it's not a, a big difference in price. Um, and again, you can personalize the, the viewing modes on these machines, and there's a three-year warranty on these devices. Um, however, we don't tend to have to do much with the warranty because they are they are made very well. Um, another CC, CCTV that we use is the Acrobat, um, and and when the Acrobat came out, it was a pretty exciting thing for us because it created kind of a new class of CCTV. We've never had what I would consider a portable desktop CCTV, and and working in Arizona, that was important for us because a lot of our patients spend uh, the winters here and the summers uh, somewhere else. Well, those patients were having to get two CCTVs, one for each place. Uh, the Acrobat was our first option where they could actually take it back and forth and only have to get one of them. Um, now, we have done, there was a time in our practice where Acrobat was uh, by far and away the most common CCTV that, that one of our patients would, would use. And that's changed a little bit because we do have more patients using the DaVinci at this point because it offers um, most all of the same things that the Acrobat would um, and also in having the ability to have the text-to-speech has, has made it so that it's just uh, more common that our patients would still choose the DaVinci over the Acrobat. But the Acrobat still has a place. Um, it, it, I think it's a little bit... Um, easier to carry around, although I've had people disagree with me on that too. So they're, they're both pretty portable. So, um, But the Acrobat's features are going to be very similar to what the, the Da Vinci is doing in that it allows you to read, write, you can work with your hands. It's very successful in helping people work with their hands, um, doing crafts, um, writing, because there's a big area underneath that camera that allows for that. Um, you can also point the camera at your own face and do makeup and shaving, like I was explaining with the Da Vinci. And you can see other people. You can point it um, at other people. And so we'll point Acrobat at my daughter, and my grandfather is able to see her live and not just in a, in a photo. And, and that's been a pretty important thing. And you can point it off in the distance to see things. Um, again, it's an autofocus camera, and it comes in multiple um, screen um, sizes. Um, and has many different viewing modes to help you find what works for it. It has a two-year warranty. Um, the Transformer is a newer product that uh, we have been using quite a bit with our students and with our professionals who are constantly having to go to presentations in different areas. The advantage the Transformer has is it's incredibly portable, um, very easy to carry around, not much more than carrying around uh, 
you would use it with a laptop, and so it doesn't really add much more weight to what you would be carrying around your laptop. Um, again, the advantages to it are similar to what you see with the Acrobat and the DaVinci. It has a few extras, the extras being that it's more portable. The other thing that it does is it does capture images. So I'll have patients who use it and they can point it um, at their board where their professor has written notes and they can take a picture and it captures that board. Well, then the patient is able to go in after the fact and zoom in and, and see what the professor's written on the board. It's a very useful tool in taking notes um, for our patients who uh, are students or, again, who attend presentations often. Um, it weighs less than three pounds. Magnification range is, is absolutely adequate, 2.4 to 30 times. And that's based on the idea that you'd be using a laptop with it that's got a 17-inch screen. If you use a bigger screen, the magnification is bigger. The camera rotates to full 330 degrees, which allows for reading, distance, and self-viewing modes, just like the Acrobat and the DaVinci. Um, and again, it uses the, a laptop as its monitor, so it doesn't have its own monitor. You're using it with a laptop or a desktop computer or um, just an LCD monitor that you have. Um, it's battery operated and can last up to eight or to four hours um, of a full charge. And it has its own built-in lighting, so if you're in a room where the, the presentation, they've dimmed the lights, you'll still be able to see um, with your transformer. Um, and it's very easy to install. You just plug it into the USB port and um, it is plug and play. And it has a two-year warranty. Uh, the Amigo is the largest portable CCTV uh, that we have available. Um, I use the Amigo in patients who uh, are about 2200 or worse uh, because they need the wider screen. Um, it's, it's still light enough that you can carry it around, but it has a very large screen. Um, and you can use it carrying around to see price tags, to see medicine labels, to read. It has a tilting screen um, that can be very helpful as well. You can connect the Amigo to a TV monitor so you can get even larger field of view. And the other thing you can do is freeze an image. And I show patients you can hold it up to a price tag, push the button, and it freezes it, and then bring it closer to your face and see it more clearly. So you don't have to get right up on things to see the images. Um, again, it's a, it's a high definition image. The magnification range is a little smaller than the desktop ones, but still very adequate. 14 times magnification is usually enough for most patients. Um, again, it's a 6.5 inch screen, which is the, the biggest screen we have in, in portable CCTVs. Um, and it has six different viewing modes for as far as contrast and brightness. Uh, the Pebble is uh, the most portable CCTV option we have, and, and it comes in three different sizes. Uh, the 4.3 inch screen, the 3.5 inch screen, and then now there's a Pebble Mini, which is even smaller. Um, the Pebble is basically something that someday we, we envision probably uh, replacing optical magnifiers. Um, again, optical magnifiers don't enhance the contrast the way the Pebble does, and they also don't give you as wide of a field of view. Um, as uh, Pebble does. Um, the Pebble is obviously an ideal size for patients to carry with them. It fits in, in your pocket in a lot of cases. Um, this is a slide we use to kind of demonstrate the difference between optical magnifiers and, and the Pebble. Again, um, I do foresee a day where, where we're doing very little in, in optical magnifiers and, and most of it will be with electronic devices like the Pebble or the Pebble Mini or the 3.5 inch Pebble. Um, it can be used for reading and many near spotting tasks. Uh, if someone really wants to read a lot, read a book, um, read uh, uh, newspapers, they, they are going to do better with a desktop CCTV just because the Da Vinci or the Merlin, um, because they're going to see a wider field of view and be able to read more efficiently. Um, I, I tend to describe the pebble as for spotting things at near, reading a menu, reading a thermostat, reading mail or bills. Um, and so those kind of things, and stove dials and therm, uh, as well. Um, they can also be used to sign documents, such as checks and receipts, so you can see what you're writing. And so it's a very good portable device. Um, its magnification is two to 10 times. Uh, again, there's three different screen sizes, um, 28 different viewing modes. It's got a foldable handle, so you can hold it like a magnifier, or you can fold it up and rest it on the paper, which I find to be pretty helpful. Uh, and you can freeze images, like I was describing with Amiga. 
and it's got a two-year warranty. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. Um, at this point, uh, we are going to open up uh, the discussion for questions. Um, so I'll hand it back over to Jerry. Yes, hi. If anybody has a question, please, at the bottom of your screen, it says type a message here. Um, take a moment and uh, type in a message, and we'll, Dr. Huff will be happy to answer it. So we'll just give you a moment. So as we're waiting for questions to come in, um, I, I always get questions after talks like this about, well, how do I find out about these things? Um, and, and do I need to go to Arizona um, to, uh, to get, see these things? The, the good news is, is most everywhere you live um, in the country, there is going to be someone who um, can get to you who provides uh, the devices I was talking about or the services that I, that I talked about. And so um, there are resources available um, to help um, find different uh, sources. I know on, on Hans Vision's website uh, they do have a resources by state um, section um, where you can find people who provide uh, exams and, and services like we do here at Viewfinder in Arizona. I'm just getting in the questions now, Dr. Huff, so I will begin with the first one. And um, can, the first question is, can a low vision person drive a car? That's a question that obviously we, we get a lot. Um, the requirements for driving are different from state to state. Every state has its own laws as to what allows people to drive. Um, there are options uh, to help people who are visually impaired uh, be safer to drive. We use bioptic telescopes in Arizona, and I think there's about 37 states that allow those. They're telescopes that allow people to see street signs from further away. What I always tell patients about bioptics is they do not help you see cars and traffic. If your vision has made it so that you are not able to see where cars are or where pedestrians are perfectly, then, then you just shouldn't be driving. Now, if you can see traffic and you can see cars, you just can't see street signs from far enough away to pass the test. A bioptic telescope usually uh, can't allow you to as long as your state allows for that. Okay, another question. I think maybe I'll answer that one. It says, enhanced vision used to make the Geordie, which my mother loved. She has dry AMD. It has since stopped working and can't be repaired. Yes, the, the, the parts that we use to make the Geordie are no longer available and we are hoping in the future to bring a new Geordie-like product to market. Uh, and, and the second part of the question, Dr. Huff, is do you know of an alternative to the, to the Geordie um, that's available in the market currently? Uh, no, uh, we don't have anything available um, at this point. Um, again, the Jordy, the advantage to it was it did allow for distance uh, vision with it. Uh, if you're, if a lot of my patients who use their Jordy also used it for reading, um, obviously the the this options I just discussed um, are actually probably better for reading than the Jordy was. 
Uh, the big advantage to the Geordi was it did have distance vision capabilities. Um, at this point, because uh, it's not available anymore, we, we don't have electronic magnification for distance. Um, that's portable. And so what we have to use um, would be telescopes. Uh, again, the bioptic telescopes I was describing, monocular handheld telescopes, um, and those help bring things uh, closer and bigger. Uh, the problem is, is they do narrow the field of view quite a bit. Okay, uh, another question. When you do not live in Arizona, who helps the client determine which piece of equipment is best? Um, I can answer that. Um, anywhere that you live in the country, we have a local representatives that are willing to come to your home and do a demonstration for you. They actually will kind of evaluate your low vision condition and help you select the right product for your condition um, and actually give you a chance. Um, next question, can you give me an idea of the cost for addition uh, on a Da Vinci versus the large pebble? Yes, uh, the large pebble, the 4.3 is $645 and the new Da Vinci is $2,995. Okay, here's another question for you, Dr. Huff. What would be needed most if someone loses their partner that they rely on for visual aids? Um, what would be needed most if they lose their partner? Um, so I'm assuming they're asking what visual aids would be important. Um, obviously, uh, being able to prepare meals, um, we'd have to do something that would help with that. Um, also, um, transportation. Um, would be an important thing um, because you have to be able to get out and, and get the food. Uh, again, whether those are visual aids or the, whether they're moving somewhere that provides those services is going to be different for different individuals and, and where you live and, and uh, what your support system is. Uh, again, when, when that kind of thing happens, it is important that there is support, um, whether it be family or friends, and, and, and being willing to accept help from other patients, from other people too. All right, and um, a lot of people are asking us for a copy of the presentation. Um, it will be available by Friday on our website. So if you check our website, um, we will have a copy of this presentation available. Um, another question is, does Medicare apply for this device? Um, uh, currently, Medicare does not pay for our devices. But if you'd like to write a letter to your congressman, we would think that would be wonderful. Um, let me see what other questions. I think we're going to take one more question. And I will add on to that, Jerry. Medicare does typically provide for examinations. Um, and so to have someone evaluate you for the devices, Medicare will uh, provide that with its 80% in most offices. Um, and then the secondary insurances pay what they pay. And a lot of private insurances will pay for these services as well. Um, but again, for the devices, they just don't. Um, and I tell patients, like Jerry said, you know, if you can get that changed in Congress, that would be a great thing for everybody. Correct. And then um, our last question is, how do we get hold of your representative in our area? And so it's very simple. Just give Enhanced Vision a phone call at 888-811-3161. Six one. I, I thank Dr. Huff very much for your very informative presentation. It was quite enjoyable, and um, we want to thank you for your time. Thank all of you for listening. And again, if any of you have any questions about the devices, feel free to give us a call at 888-811-3161. Thank you all very much. Thank you.